Hey guys, Sal from Lucipixel, and welcome back. I feel today's topic is an easy one to talk about. I know it's a topic that's going to resonate with all of you, 99% of you. Not only because you're human, but of course because you're artists as well. Today I want to talk about why we are in our heads all the time and distinguishing between the good and the bad. As artists, we live in a world of imagination. We daydream, we, we pontificate, we ponder, we observe. This is what makes us who we are. More often than not, artists are very, we're very much empaths. We're very sensitive to the world around us. We're very sensitive to our loved ones or just people in general. Watching people going through different experiences, good or bad, we tend to, we tend to really sponge that in and are very deeply affected by this kind of stuff. We're also, of course, deeply affected by the thoughts in our own heads. And as an artist, not a psychologist, making that very, very clear, I have zero medical experience, zero training on the, on the topic. But as an artist, as a person, as, as a kindred spirit with you, I can say with absolute confidence that any thought, anything you have thought about yourself as a talent, as a professional, as anything, anything that you felt good or bad, I can mirror back at you through my own experiences. I can relate to pretty much anything you've experienced give or take, depending on the intensity of your experiences. So what I want to do today is walk through a couple of these thoughts, or at least thought processes that us artists can have that tend to have a little bit more of a damaging impact on us. I think those are the ones that we pro probably want to sit on a little bit more because if there are, if there are thoughts that you're feeling that inspire you, that motivate you, that empower you, that that fill you with general feelings of well-being, then I don't think I'd want to do anything to interfere with that. <laughs> Keep doing what you're doing, you're on the right track. But what if, and it's a very easy, like I said, this isn't a hard one for me, what if some of those thoughts that you're having come at the cost of your inspiration. They interfere with your inspiration. They interfere with your motivation. They interfere with your feelings of self-worth. And as artists, sometimes that our personal feelings of self-worth is tied directly into our productive feeling of self-worth. And if you're hearing jingle bells in the background, that's because Link is, Link is scratching himself, my cat. So the first one I want to talk about is probably one of the, one of the most common, boredom. And this is something that I really, really witnessed for some time, especially during the whole COVID period where a lot of us were stuck at home. For me personally, COVID didn't, at least in terms of the day-to-day -day aspects of things, COVID really didn't impact me much because my, the rhythm of my life didn't change. In fact, I would argue due to the fact that the nature of my work was from home and I worked from home and I had everything set up here, um, I would say that my job situation and my productivity situation was amplified because most people, a lot of artists ended up finding themselves at home with all of this extra time. They couldn't work. They, they didn't have other things to do. They couldn't go to school. So they took, a, they took the opportunity to take an online course. So when COVID hit, um, I didn't find myself in a state of boredom. I actually found myself in a state of having to really, really pace myself because it was coming at me fast. And as such, my mind was just constantly fixated on what I had to do next. I was constantly preoccupied with what I had to do next. But I can't say the same for a lot of my friends, my loved ones, my kids, who, who were generally used to being at school, were generally used to playing with their friends and doing stuff and following different school rules and following different rhythms and going to lunch. Or It was torture, wasn't it? It was for most of, for, for most of us who were pulled out of our daily productivity. And when you find yourself in a state where you've got too much time to think, um, you start to ruinate. 
Ruinate meaning you just start to grind through thoughts over and over again. And very often those thoughts can um, can start to affect you. If, 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 if just left to their own devices, if you just let your thoughts brood and simmer and nothing happens with it, then they can grow and manifest into something a lot, something that actually can affect you on a day-to-day -day basis. What about you? You know, are you working now? Are you busy? Are you occupied? Do you have plans? Do you have a sense of direction? Do you have a game plan, so to speak? Are you the game plan type? Are you somebody who lives their day-to-day -day life in a spontaneous way, kind of going with the flow and seeing what's next? A lot of us artists are like that. Or are you the more strategic type of artist who likes to say, okay, I'm going to be working on this and then I'm taking that mentorship and then I'm going to be going to this course and then I'm going to be practicing this and I'm going to accomplish that by next year. What kind of a person are you? If you find yourself in a position right now where you have been festering thoughts of doubt, you've been, you've been simmering, repeating thought, repeated thoughts of self-doubt, of, you know, discouragement, of upset, of overwhelm, and, um, and you don't know what to do. You're just kind of sitting there in this funk, not knowing where to do next. And maybe this has been going on for an extended period of time. If you feel that you are of sound mind and body, if you feel that you are somebody who, who generally has a healthy grasp of your mental health, then what you might, what the best recipe for you might be to make a plan. You need to plan, start planning your day out a little bit. Even if it sounds, if, even if it feels futile and if it feels like you're just doing it for the sake of doing it, oh, because Adam said it was a good idea, I guess I'll do it. Do it anyways, because action of any kind creates a momentum, right? You might not be the best uh, bowler on the planet, but guaranteed, if, even if you're, even if the ball ends up in the gutter and it rolls right off to the gutter and it slowly and, and painfully rolls its way down all the way to the end until it goes kaplunk into the pit, at least the ball was rolling. What, I, what I'm saying where you don't want to be is the person sitting down, looking at, looking at the ball rack, sitting down in a chair, not getting up for an extended period of time, pondering whether or not you should grab it in the first place. Life isn't only about strategizing in your head. It's about doing things physically. Art is a physical activity. Professionalism is a physical activity. Growth is a physical activity. I use Chris Oatley's wonderful analogy. If you subscribe to a fitness magazine and read an entire fitness magazine every single day for a year, but you never go to the gym, will you be in better shape at the end of the year? Obviously not, right? And as an artist, you need to remember that, that the act of picking up a pencil, the act of planning something out, the act of writing a little to-do list might seem completely silly and a waste of time, but you're going to see that in the act of movement, you're going to start to create synapses. You're going to, your the neurons in your brain are going to start firing off and that will lead to the triggering of an idea. Remember that the creative mind, specific, particularly the creative mind, is not so much designed to come up with random shit out of nowhere. No. The creative mind is about, it's like creating recipes. It's looking at different scenarios, different seemingly completely random, unconnected scenarios and finding a creative connection between the two of them. A tree and mustard. Have fun. You notice that as soon as I said those two words, your brain started to work. And I bet whether or not, you, whether you want to or not, now all of a sudden you're starting to imagine how tree and mustard goes together. Maybe it's a tree that's been decorated with jars of mustard hanging off of it, like bottles. Maybe somebody's, maybe it's a tree made of mustard. Maybe it's, maybe it's like Elden Ring where you're in like the land of blood, you know, where all there, there, there's puddles and mud puddles and mud splattered all over the place, right? 
and you're thinking about a, a land of mustard. Who knows? But your visual imagination is going, isn't it? What I've just done is I've created a little bit of momentum for you. And your mind's going to take it wherever it decides to. That's the first part. The second is perfectionism. Perfectionism. Isn't it crazy how, as artists, more often than not, we don't have anybody, on the day-to-day -day basis at least, when we're alone in our little art cocoon, drawing, listening to podcasts and stuff like that and doing our thing, um, how there's nobody sitting there going, this is the standard thou must reach. But yet, we tend to devalue our work so much. We tend to look at our work and, and judge it so critically, so negatively, very often. I'd say an, uh, uh, an important professional discipline for any artist is the ability to look at their artwork objectively, critically, to be able to say, okay, these are my strengths and these are my witnesses. These are my, my witnesses. Sorry, I've been watching trials all week. <laughs> this was recorded at the time of the whole Amber Heard Johnny Depp thing, right? I have thoughts on that too, but we won't go there, there, there today. But your strengths and weaknesses, right? And, um, and we tend to really focus on those weaknesses. As a professional, you want to be able to see them with an unbiased opinion, as if you're, as if somebody else is asking you to critique your own work. And as such, when you look at your own artwork and what you do in a more objective way, it allows you to be able to, to balance your growth in a way that isn't governed by negative emotion. It isn't governed by, it isn't, it isn't directed by a fear, rather, a strategic choice. You're not looking at your artwork saying, I, I'm an absolute shit artist. I, I'm in a sea full of people that can destroy me artistically. Why am I even wasting my time? That kind of thought's never going to do anything for you. Or looking at your artwork and saying, you know, like, I worked my ass off on this piece and it is absolute garbage compared to what so-and-so artist did. Why am I bothering? That if you ever, if, if any thought you have in your head leads you to give up or want to give up or to, to think about giving up, then you're doing it wrong. Because from my personal and professional experience, not only as an artist, but as a teacher, as a director, as a guy who runs a business, is everything. If I compare myself to the rest of the industry, in terms of where do I rank in terms of everybody else, I can guarantee you that I rank in the, the low 10%. Guaranteed. I know that. I'm aware of it. I'm objectively aware of the fact that I'm, I'm nowhere near the master I wish to one day be, that one day the gods of art are going are gonna to touch me on the forehead with their magic wand and all of a sudden I'm going to be the best of the best. It's not going to happen. But at a certain point, I had to come to terms with the fact that I'm being authentic. I'm being myself. I'm doing what feels right to me. I'm living in a world. I represent something in this community of art that makes me feel connected. I no longer look at my art. In fact, I can't, I can't say I always, I, I ever really felt this way in general about my art. But I would say as I mature, I become a lot better at accepting the fact that being the best isn't what's isn't what matters most <laughs> it's not what matters most it's about the community that i'm a part of what does art mean to me what does it mean to me to be an artist who am i associating myself with with my art what how does the style of art that i produce connect emotionally and visually with my kindred spirits, with my fellow artists. Where do I put myself? Where do I place myself in this? It, to me, art is community. To me, art is my family. And I'm just, a, I'm a single member, member of this big, wonderful, beautiful family. And whether or not I'm the best of the best doesn't matter. 
What matters to me is that I'm being true to myself. What matters to me is that I'm being authentic. But for so many of us artists, we go on ArtStation, we go on Google, wherever, and we our eyes just get locked on some artistic genius. And everything else around it just disappears. And we look at that and we go, you know, I'll never be that. There's no, I, I don't even understand what that artist does. And I, I'm, as I'm saying this, as I'm actually saying, as these words are coming out of my own mouth, I'm visualizing in my head certain artists. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't even understand how it's done. It's like a, it's like a completely rare foreign language to me. That doesn't make any sense. My 25-year-old self would have looked at that and said, fuck my life. Fuck everything. Fuck all of this. And you can imagine me symbolically flipping my table over and walking out. Right? My 46-year-old self? Or I could also... My 30-16-year-old self, that is. <laughs> uh, looks at it and goes, wow. What a talent. What a wonderful artist. What a beautiful form of expression. I completely love what that artist does. And appreciate them for their beauty, appreciate them for their accomplishments, appreciate them for the joy that what they do brings me. As if I was appreciating a best friend, somebody who I truly love, and, and just looking at them and saying, you're a beautiful, beautiful person with a beautiful ability, a beautiful talent, and I love surrounding myself with, your, with it. And realizing that none of what they do is a reflection of the quality of myself. I can only be as good and as authentic as I can be. And to me, as long as I'm being my most authentic self, then I'm satisfied with that. And because I love what I'm doing, because I'm a part of it, because it's a, my core form of communication to the rest of the world, I will inevitably keep getting better. It's kind of, it's kind of unavoid, avoid, unavoidable when you do it every day, right? I can't get worse. <laughs> Unless I get a brain injury or something like that, God forbid, right? So I'm not worried about that. And I realize that the growth, how fast I grow and how successful I am it has never been a result of how much self-hate I have or how much I've compared myself to other people. The f I found that my greatest self-growth comes from being my most authentic self. It's something that I, pr something that I preach all the time on my channel. I know that that's the right thing to preach at my age to you because that's where I've personally found the most growth, period. I'm not giving you hippie spiritual advice. I'm giving you practical advice. It's practical. This is, I'm telling you, this is the way it was done for me. I'm not saying it necessarily works the same way for everybody else, but that's definitely worked for me. And I'm guilt, I live guilt free. Now, does that mean to, you know, whatever, well, I'll paint whatever shit I want, no, whatever, I don't care. No, it doesn't mean that. No, I do strive for my greatest. Every single time I sit down to do a work of art, I have in my head, I want this to be my greatest achievement. When every single time I sit down to do a painting, I always want to outdo myself. I've been that way. I'm sure you're that way too. All artists are like that. Every single time you sit down to do a painting, I doubt any artist on the planet with any sense of ambition looks at their own work and says, I'll be happy as long as I can recreate the same thing I've done last year. I'm cool. You know, as long as I can nestle myself safely in the herd and not be seen, then I'll be perfectly happy. Artists aren't like that. <laughs> we kind of produce art. We express ourselves because we wish to be heard. We express ourselves because we wish to be seen. So of course I'm going to always try to achieve my best accomplishment. And I see growth through that. But the operative, the operative word here is my accomplishment. I'm not trying to become somebody else. I'm not trying to replicate somebody else's fame, somebody else's successes. That's theirs. I'm there to admire them and to promote them and to, and to encourage them to do their thing. I want to outdo myself. And I don't have to outdo myself by a mile, just a little bit, just enough to say the momentum is still there. I haven't become stagnant. I haven't become complacent in my comfortable little world. No, I have to continue to grow. 
The other thing that I've spoken about, another very big thing, and this kind of ties into the last one, and I don't think it's necessary to go on, go on about it too much, is who and what you expose yourself to. In fact, I would fit that directly into the whole conversation of perfectionism, what I was just talking about two seconds ago. And I've mentioned this, and I'm going to reiterate it. Who you expose yourself to and why you expose yourself to different artists is very, very important. And when you are studying, researching other artists, how you research other artists should be different when you're working and when you're not working. These are two, these should be two different, two different types of reaching out for inspiration. When I am not working, when I'm shooting the shit and, and fanboying over certain artists with my friends or my students or, or other fellow artists, um, it's a free for all. Just like you feel, I look at their, their work and I go, these are all art gods to me, all of them. But when I'm sitting down to paint, I completely avoid them like the plague. I stay the hell away from looking at Ahmed's work when I'm working. I stay the hell away from my friend Tyler's work. I stay the hell away from Loish or Ross Traws or Ethan. I, I can't even look, don't even show them in my peripheral. I don't even want to know they exist. Goodbye. I keep myself locked into my own little world. And, if, and I've described it. If you want to get a visual interpretation of my own little, my own little world, it's me, it's Pinterest, it's either, you know, uh, true crime videos, something moody or horror stories like Mr. Nightmare or, of course, Vati Vidya. I've got them on my favorites bar, right? And I just listen to that. I go on Pinterest. I've got my headphones on. I get myself all locked into my little quiet little bubble. And I, get, I just get lost into my little world because the sounds and the images, everything reminds me it pulls me down into my artistic core again to me to that beating heart inside me and i keep myself locked into that during the entire the entire length of my painting process and i don't pull away from it in fact i know well enough that if i do pull myself away and if i start watching some 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 youtube videos that aren't related or if i start watching johnny harris or if i start watching let me know or i start watching something else that's intriguing and pulls me away you can guarantee I've just cut, I've just, I've just snipped the wire to my imagination and I have to pull myself back into it again. It's like trying to keep yourself in a meditative state. If somebody starts blasting heavy metal music, you're going to get, you're going to like, shit. And you're going to have to wait till that to go to pass so you can get yourself back into the right headspace. So I'm very, very adamant about that. I'm very, very strict when it comes to keeping myself in there. When I'm not working, I fanboy more more hardcore than all of you combined. But when I'm painting, keep me the hell away from my inspira from those inspirations because they don't they're too different. They're too foreign. I don't understand it and it, it's like somebody coming and knocking me right off the bridge. Now the last one and a very important one is when there are experiences, negative experiences that interfere with your ability to appreciate yourself, to be productive, to see the worth in what you do. And in delving into that side of it, it's extremely important for me as your friend, as somebody who cares about you, as somebody who wants what's best for you, to let you know loud and clear, as I've said many times in the past, there's a fine line between having a rough time and suffering from some serious issue, be it internal or external. So I make, I always make a strong point of letting you know how far I'm going to let my advice go. And then as soon as we kind of cross the threshold into something more serious, that's when I recommend you go and talk to a professional, right? Um, and just to kind of dwell on this topic for a second, due to the nature of my videos, and I might have mentioned this before in the past too, I forget what I say five minutes after I say it, but um, due to the nature of my videos, due to the nature of my talks where I get personal, 
right? It gets personal and it gets emotional. Um, I very often have people reach out to me for help. I'll get emails or I'll get messages. And some of them can be very long-winded, very personal emails talking about family issues and depression and, and, you know, neurological issues and abusive issues and all that kind of stuff. When and if I see that, I get my reply to those types of those types of messages when people are reaching out for something that personal I tell them loud and clear the same thing I'm going to tell you loud and clear if you're going through something like that that's very serious if you've got any kind of serious issues at home or with your loved ones or personal issues and stuff like that that are that are overwhelming you um, as an act of compassion because I really care about your well-being because I do authentically care about your well-being not because I'm brushing you off and telling you to F off and it's none of my business, but because I care, because I, because I care, I would never, ever, um, pretend to be able to help you through something like that. It would be irresponsible of me to offer you psychological advice, even if my intentions were the best, because I have zero clue about the incredible rich complexity of your life nor do I know what's necessary to help you overcome that and move forward and find the tools you need to get over that kind of stuff. Okay. And that plays very much into what I'm talking about today. Um, I'm not trained. I'm not trained in that. I, I, it's far beyond my abilities. And I know very well out of compassion, out of just like you, somebody who wants to help you, somebody who, who'd love to be able to be the person with the solution to the problem that has been plaguing you for so long. I'd love to be able to say that I've been able to offer you that. I don't because I'm gambling with your health, period. <clears throat> and that to me is unacceptable. That said, that said, there are past experiences from a multitude of different sources that can scar you, that leave a scar. And I have been scarred numerous times in the past from many different sources, from shitty employers to family members to loved ones. I've been through some shit and I've experienced some pretty heavy stuff. And um, to give you an example, Again, an example I've that's already in evidence, if we're going to talk legal talk today, <laughs> right? Again, I've been watching the, the court trials all week. Um, it's already been sub submitted in evidence, so you can publish it. Um, talking about an ex-employer I had, and his name was Alain. In case you're listening, Alain, this one's dedicated to you. Alain was a piece of shit. And uh, he, he was a type of boss who believed in demotivation. So he would sit down and he'd tell you what a, what a useless piece of crap and how little talent you had. And every day, it was an open concept studio with around 50 or 60 of us all on the floor. He would publicly humiliate and shame and insult people every single day. And he was good at it too. He really knew how to look somebody right square between the eyes, look at people to identify with that person's vulnerability, what it is they're striving to achieve and say, you're never going to achieve it and you're wasting everybody's fucking time. It's kind of ironic how at the same time that he was telling me and every other person in the studio what complete useless pieces of crap they were, um, he never fired anybody. You'd think somebody who was surrounded by such a, a, such a cult of reprobates and incompetence would clean up shop and sack everybody and rehire, but he never did that. Why? Because his intention wasn't to actually get rid of you. It was just to make you wish you were gone <laughs> so that he could, so he could control you. Right. And, uh, that left a scar. I walked away from that. I can say with, with my dignity, you know, he sacked me and I, I took, I reached out my hand to shake his hand and he flinched because he thought I was about to punch him in the face. And I looked him square in the eyes with a nice, confident smile on, my, smile on my face. It helped, too, that I was about a foot and a half taller than the guy. 
in front of everybody and I said, thank you. Thank you for your time. I wish you the best. And I turned around and I walked out with my tail way up in the air, chin up. I walked out of there scarred. I walked out of there hurt. I was publicly, publicly humiliated by this asshole and I didn't show it, but it hurt. And I walked away and I, I, I walked down the street through the multimedia square of Montreal where all the graphic design studios and stuff like that were amongst walking past all these employed folks in their shirts and looking all professionals and out on the out in the front of the buildings on their smoke breaks and et cetera, et cetera, being an unemployed artist who just got sacked for being a crap artist essentially and I walked up the street being unemployed 15 minutes into my unemployment and I got onto the subway and I took the ride home with that feeling in me and it sucked now poetically a week later I was hired at another studio about about a 25 second walk from my other studio right in that same area just out of complete coincidence because I found the article I found the the job posting online and I started working there and within a couple of weeks I was or months I was promoted to director and it was and it was there was a moment of poetic satisfaction crossing paths with him and his boyfriend as as a director now and uh and as I walked by, I, I looked at him and said, hi, Ale. And he couldn't, he couldn't lift me, his eyes and look at me in the face. Because as circumstances had it, for the first time and only time in my life, I had the opportunity to be able to say, you thought it was a piece of shit, but that guy thought I made a pretty good director. So fuck you too, buddy. <laughs> his boyfriend was cool. He was, he was a nice guy. I never, I always got along with him. But him in particular, fuck him. You know, he didn't, he didn't deserve any, any, you know, second chance as far as that goes. Did it heal my scar? No. When people say bad things about you or people hurt you, it, it doesn't fully go away, does it? You know, if I, if I turn to you and tell you that you're, even if you've got the most perfect head of beautiful, thick, rich hair on the planet, and if I say, oh God, your hair looks a little dry and ratty. If I make some, some personal, insensitive, hurtful comment like that, Guaranteed within a week, if you don't have a lot of self-confidence, you will have changed your hairstyle, cut your hair, or dyed it. That's me That's me taking control of your feelings of self-worth, isn't it? Now, these kinds of, this kind of abusive or just plainly negative or judgmental uh, treatment comes from a multitude of different sources. It can come from family. It can come from lev- loved ones. It can come from... In fact, more often than not, it comes from loved ones. If you think about it, we tend to be harshest on the ones that matter to us most. For better or for worse, right? We tend to judge those who we make a part of our lives more, more, um, more, more intensely than we do to strangers. That's why we tend to be ourselves and we tend to pass our, our strongest judgments on, the, on our loved ones. But when that judgment starts to attack that person's feeling of self-worth, they've crossed a line. You've crossed a line. And that is a mistake that you need to apologize for and take back. And if that person refuses to, for whatever emotional issues or narcissistic reasons they have, they, they can and will not uh, repair the damage they've done and stop what they've done, then that is a toxic relationship that needs to be ended. It needs to be left And if you find yourself in a situation where you're not only dealing with that kind of emotional abuse, but maybe a a threat of physical, you feel trapped, then you need to find a a safe way to get out and to protect yourself from that kind of a situation. But it's not always that epic. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just a nasty grandmother. My grandmother, Nina Zolkevich. On one level, an absolute inspiring, strong, independent, funny, creative woman. On another level, a real bitch. (laughs) 
You know, I remember sitting down at one point, I was sitting down drawing. My family had gone out on some trips. I, I decided to stay home for whatever silly reason. I thought I was going to have the house to myself because I was a, a late teenager, probably 18, 19 or something. My two sisters and my mom went off to Mexico on a trip and I decided I wanted the house to myself, not knowing that my mother was going to ask my grandmother to stay with me that week, which kind of completely destroyed that, that whole event. And I remember my grandmother looking down over my shoulder in her very Nina, Yanina type of way and looking down over my shoulder and looking at my drawing and saying, why are you wasting your time? You might as well be a garbage man. At a point where I was really sensitive about my talent, you know, I would say that I see that artists that are the most vulnerable to judgment are usually students, usually artists between 18 and 25. The most emotional emails and the most emotional conversations I have with fellow artists are usually artists around the around that age, around my, my, my daughter's age, 20, around the 20 to 25 range. And to say that to me at that particular point of time, oh, you witch. Oh. And it really fucking hurt my feelings. And I remember my mother calling me from Mexico uh, uh, a little bit later and uh, maybe the next day and she says, how's everything going? And I literally broke into tears. That woman literally brought me to tears. I, she just psychologically loved to stab at people. And she said, she said, mom, to my grandmother, she said, it's okay. Adam can stay home for the, for the next week. And she let me have the house to myself for a week. That kind of, sh obviously what she said worked, didn't it? Because here I am at 46 years old, <laughs> still bitching about it. Now, thankfully, thankfully, I didn't live with that on a daily basis. You know, thankfully, I didn't live with that particular type of harsh judgment, that type of nasty attitude every single day. Although I was with her, I was around her a lot growing up. Um, I had something to balance that off of. I had examples of family and friends that didn't do that. So that helped. Just like having good job opportunities gave me an opportunity to balance my overall perspective of self. But those negative events, they did leave their little scars. And they, I still feel them to this day. They still do. It's like a little bit of a nagging thorn in my side that reminds me not to be too, to get too big for my britches because I, I do have the ability to suck too, or at least feel like shit about myself. I do have that ability, but I also know that I'm also a person who doesn't, who doesn't struggle with any emotional issues. Generally speaking, I'm not somebody who has any neurological issues that affect my ability to perceive the world around me or uh, in a way that, that negatively alters my sense of self. I'm around it all the time. I'm very aware of people very close to me that deal with day-to-day -day struggles. I have a son, Lucas, he's got ADHD, right? I'm very aware of and very open to how he sees the world and I'm very sensitive to that. And that's some things that I help him to navigate with. I don't, I don't have to navigate that. But that doesn't mean I'm immune to hurt. It doesn't mean I'm immune to negative judgment. But there's somebody else in your life that might be doing this too. It's not a loved one. It's not a shitty employer. It's not a, a partner in your life who, who is hurtful or abusive. It might be you. You might, be neg you might be negatively judging yourself. You might be emotionally abusive to yourself. And more often than not, again, not trying to pretend to be a psychologist or have any kind of expertise on this, but more often than not, the way you judge yourself is a manifestation of how you've been treated by others. Are you somebody, for instance, who tends to really devalue your own feelings? Are you the type of person who feels entirely responsible for other people's well-being at the cost of your own well-being? Do you burn yourself out trying to keep other people happy? Are you? Well, that's a very common trait of, of people who've lived with narcissists. People who are used to having their feelings devalued. People who are used to being at the beck and call of other people 24 hours a day. Even people who are supposed to be your caretakers, your guardians, your superiors. If you find yourself 
hating on yourself, abusing yourself, you need, you need help for that. You need to talk to somebody. You need to talk to a professional. You need to talk to a counselor. You need to talk to a psychologist, or maybe you've been through some shit. Maybe you've suffered some pretty traumatic experiences. Maybe you're in a relationship with or raised by somebody who taught you to doubt yourself, taught you to feel like shit about yourself. I guarantee you, if I was raised by my grandmother, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I'm sure I would be a much less confident version of myself. And maybe I wouldn't be here sharing my feelings with you on YouTube because I didn't feel like my contributions to your life had any value. <clears throat> but um, yeah, because I want you to know something. If you're being your most authentic self, if you're being genuine to yourself, nobody, and I guarantee you, nobody, unless they're complete douchebags, self-centered, narcissistic douchebags, nobody will give a crap how good you are, how skilled you are as an artist or as a person, if you're being authentic. The only thing people have a negative sensitivity to is people who aren't genuine, people who are putting on a face, people who are being inauthentic. But if you're being yourself, you're good to go. And there's absolutely nothing stopping you from moving forward. Just keep on moving forward. Keep on working. Keep on exploring yourself. Remember the most, in thing, most important thing about art is that art is the greatest tool to discover who you truly are because it forces you to look past your own ego and to, and to discover something that has a lot more depth so that other people can feel it too. Capiche? With that said, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.